know, well, that's a difficult question. Because <laughs> I hope that the younger version of myself that you're talking about would be a little bit brighter than I was <laughs> as the younger person. <laughs> but dialogue, dialogue, dialogue is always very important. We both learn that way. Well, I think you recognize a good teacher first if they're clear and understand what they're talking about, but they also have to know how to challenge you, not in a way that turns you off, but in a way that challenges you to turn on. So a good teacher always makes you do something a little bit more than you thought you could do. I go to the lab in order to interact with my postdoctoral students and try to see if I can shape them to not copy, but to ask questions and to think. And we have to have a little dialogue because you don't pretend to be the fount of all wisdom. Wisdom comes out of dialogue. So you have to develop the capacity to expose your own ignorance in order that they may discover their own wisdom. First, don't copy. Think about the problem. And to remember that we, we compete against problems, not against people. <laughs> well, as I say, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> and, and don't be afraid to think. And it's all right to understand what has gone before, but don't just rely on copying. But develop your own internal voice and your own internal means of interpreting. It's a very individual thing, and there are many different ways to be successful. And I, <clears throat> some people are very good at, at building equipment. You've got to be able to measure, and you've got to be able to know what you're measuring and you to interpret and so on. There are other people who do theory and develop theoretical understanding. And then there are people who develop intuition. <laughs> and you have to have some, sci some scientific intuition as well. And every scientist is an individual and brings a different talent to the problem. But you have to be willing to dialogue so that we can all benefit from one another's intuition. We all have to recognize that we're going to fail sometimes, all right? But some failures are more traumatic than others. <laughs> it meant that I learned to love nature, that I had, but it meant also that I would never have been a very good reader. You have to struggle to read as best you can, but you have to not worry. You have to just get out and enjoy life and enjoy what you can do well and do it as well as you can. We are supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength, all right? And, but that's separate from loving our neighbor as ourselves. That means nature is God's creation. So we should love nature and understand nature the best we can in order to show our love for the Creator. It's a wonderful thing. This nature that we, this, this, this earth and its abundance and its surprises and its resources and its change. So for me, it's just, I'm grateful to be a part of nature. I can't say that I am a good musician. I'm not particularly musical, but I got rhythm. <laughs> I, I, I prefer, you know, I like Bach. I was to read, a, take a course in poetry. 
And of course, if you don't read very well, poetry is a more difficult thing to really understand, metaphor and so on. That remark is the, is the best way to teach somebody. You say, well, all right, get going, boy. Maybe you can do it a little better. <laughs> so I, I had to try to see how would I learn how to read poetry? And I thought, well, the only way to do that is to write poetry. And if you start to write poetry, then you realize the problem he has to make the metaphors and so on. So that's how I started to write poetry. And I tried to write a poem for my wife every birthday and every Christmas. My wife and I shared very much a vision of Christianity. And so I would always write something that was relating to character or to something or other of that nature. And it always had a religious bent to it. I was in graduate school and she would, came a little later on in my graduate school time. And I was living in the international house, and she was living in the international house, and the girls lived on one side, and the boys on another. And we met at the, the, the dining room table in between. <laughs> she didn't blow me over because of, she was glamorous. She wasn't glamorous. She wasn't. She was just herself. She was very comfortable with herself, and so it was very easy for me to make a friend. You see, love has to do with friendship. Friendship. I suppose the most important thing is that you have a, a, a companion, that you share the, the deep things of life. But it's always difficult for a man to understand the secrets in a woman's heart. Well, I think you should be enthusiastic about life. You should enjoy what you do. And I say to myself each day, help us, O Lord, so long as we live, to live nobly and to the good cheer of our fellow man. I think that uh, you, to live life at the fullest, you have to be able to have dialogue with people who want a dialogue with you. And so I think you have to uh, just be thankful for life and be thankful for people who would like to engage in meaningful dialogue with you. Yes, I don't think pessimism gets us anywhere. <laughs> so, even though we may live in illusions, we have, to, we have to work very hard to fulfill our illusions as best we can. <laughs> One of the great mysteries of life is memory. I, I helped somebody who was trying to understand memory and the sources of memory and so on, and I learned it was a rather complex problem. <laughs> My first visit here that summer, or that autumn, was the autumn that Hitler moved into Poland. I am very grateful to the city of Stockholm and to all the people who are here, and to this, this not, not only the city, but what the city represents and so on. So thank you all for your hospitality and for even embarrassing me by asking me so many Questions I don't answer very well. Well, I've realized the stupidity of war, the waste of war, the bravery of some. <laughs> and I believe not in walls, but in building relationships, all right? If we can build relationships, we, we minimize the attempts to go to war and uh, I think that science is an international language and helps to build the relationships that are necessary to suppress the greed and stupidities that lead to war. My lab colleagues are very good to me. We, 
enjoy working together in the laboratory, but I don't necessarily hobnob with all of them in, in, in the recreation times. We, we do it in, in the laboratory and so on. <clears throat> but I, that doesn't mean I don't like other friends <laughs> and that I have other friends too. I dialogue with them about other things than just their work. And so if we're eating, they bring me some lunch and we're having some lunch together and so on, we talk about other things. When my wife was living, and she was a gracious hostess and a good cook, and so then we would invite students who couldn't go home for their holidays always to come and enjoy their holidays and she would, she would cook very well. I'm afraid I miss my wife quite a bit. She was very special. A good team is never selfish, it shares. And recognizing they do things together. I shouldn't steal the intellectual property of my students and they shouldn't steal the intellectual property of one another. You know, science is an international language and I've enjoyed traveling all over the world and sharing scientific discussions with people from almost every country in the world. We're not good friends in the normal sense of friendship, but he has always been a, a person who has listened to what I'm doing and reacted to it and I, we've, we've had dialogue in the science together. In that sense, we're good friends and he, well, for example, when I say, well, LICO2 is going to be a very good cathode, he immediately comes up and says, yeah, and you've got to join it with carbon. <laughs> science is an international language. That's one of the beauties of science. And so there's always international interaction in all aspects of science. That's why people publish papers and read papers in order to be able to interact and dialogue as best you can with everybody who's interested in the same kind of problems you are. I'm not an astrophysicist to continue with their exploration or, or particle physicist to keep looking at what are the building blocks of nature and so on. <clears throat> but uh, the scientific, I mean, people do learn some things and even I learn some things. <laughs> and so my scientific landscape changes according to how much I've learned in the last year, all right? The science hasn't changed, it's just my understanding of the science has changed and come along. Quietness. <laughs> I mean, you have to think, that's hard work. And you, I don't, you know, some people can listen to music and, and think at the same time, but this, if you're a musician, they never want background music, right? <laughs> <laughs> you either listen to the music or you turn it off. <laughs> I suppose I do my best thinking when I'm in dialogue with somebody about a problem. I think dialogue is very important for thinking. And the other, sometimes, when you have to write something up, your dialogue with yourself, dialoguing with yourself as you write something up, and you think about things because you have to try to be clear when you write and you have to try to be brief and get away with the clutter and just get to the point. I mean, we're still trying to get better batteries, of course. And I have some people who've come and are here with me at the moment. Uh, they are two people from Iran, Hadi and his wife, Aisel. And 
they're polymer people, and I'm, 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 they're trying to teach me a lot about polymers. And, I, and so you see, I like, through dialogue with every people you have, then you keep learning. So they keep teaching me something all the time. I think I have some contribution to make. They seem to be happy to talk to me anyway. <laughs> and, and I'm very happy to talk with them. The, the dependence of modern society on the energy storage and the fossil fuel is not sustainable. We have to learn to harness the energy that comes to us from the sun, either in the form of wind or in the form of ra radiant energy. And we have to be able to convert it into electric power, which we know how to do. But it's diverse and, and, and you can transport electric power over wires over some distance, but you have to have a collection site. But you have to be able to store that energy because it comes in at time scales that are very different than the time scales of demand. So that's one of the reasons you work on batteries, because they store electric power. Well, they have to come. We're, but we have to keep working hard on it to improve it, okay? We haven't solved all the problems yet, but rechargeable batteries exist, and rechargeable batteries do a fairly good job, but they don't do as good a job as they need to do. So we keep working to see if we can improve them.